Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nature Inclusive Design, Innovation in Land-Water Interface. My name is Shomit Wartenberg, and I'm head of design at eConcrete and an architect by trade. This session is part of a technical webinar series we've been hosting. It really began as a tool for sharing information during COVID, but it has since grown into a large platform, and we're very happy about that. Uh, it's a pleasure to have three great expert speakers joining us today. Foko van de Boot from Viscalis and Ecoshape, Edmundo Colon Izquierdo from Eco, and Gina Wirth from Scape. We have some great presentations coming up, including Building with Nature in Indonesia, Advocating for Change in Puerto Rico, and Designing with Specific Species in Mind that are key to our survival. Now, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Each speaker will have between 10 and 15 minutes to present. We'll then have a short panel discussion and then take it to an audience Q&A. Now, if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A chat box you see at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can in the time available. After the webinar finishes in the coming days, you will get a follow-up email with a link to a certificate of attendance and also a link to a recording of the webinar, which will be available on YouTube channel of eConcrete. <laughs> okay, let's kick off with our first speaker. Foko van de Goot is Senior Environmental Engineer at Pascalis, where he worked on several international capital maintenance dredging projects. Foco is also a program manager at Ecoshape, where he coordinates the innovation program, Building with Nature. The program focusing, focuses on the development of marine infrastructure solutions that utilize and enhance the natural system so that ecological and economic interests strengthen one another. He joins us today from the Netherlands. Foco, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. So whenever you're ready, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Slombridge, and thanks also uh, Econcrete for organizing this uh, this webinar um, and inviting me to uh, to speak here. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, I hope you can all see my screen, and if not, please let me know. Um, so before diving into uh, our Building with Nature Indonesia project, I first would like to explain a little bit our, about our Building with Nature program in general. Um, Building in Nature started off as an um, innovative design approach uh, in the Netherlands, um, where we faced, similar to many other places in the world, of course, all kinds of challenges related to infrastructure development. Um, it, it was needed to gain more insight in the uh, large scale impact of our projects in, um, in, the, in the marine environment. And that's why we initiated a, a knowledge and innovation program to understand better how we can integrate nature into, um, uh, into infrastructure development and make them an inherent uh, part of the, of the design. So we tried to make a shift from building against nature towards building with nature. And this program started off um, in 2008 and it's, it really looks for solutions that harnesses both the forces of um, nature to benefit uh, economy, society and the environment. And it's very much an, a collaborative um, a program where with all sectors, so the private sector, um, knowledge development and, and scientists, governmental organizations and societal organizations, NGOs, we collaborate, uh, uh, collaboratively design and execute projects. And the fundament really is to do this from the ground. Uh, so we start with pilot projects, learn uh, in the field and try to translate these lessons into more generic uh, uh, guidelines. And they always the aim to upskill and mainstream these concepts. Um, and this follows very much a, a trend that started, um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, a decade or so. Uh, we all familiar with the term nature-based solutions and there's an, an enormous amount of guidance um, and documentation about this, this, um, uh, this concept. Uh, we all realize that nature-based solutions or nature in general should be an integral part of, uh, of the problems we are facing and it's acknowledged by all kinds of institutes like the world bank iucn european union etc however we still lack implementation on the ground and there's still a lot to learn about how this this works 
Um, because what we have learned is that nature-based solutions or, or building with nature solutions are, they're inherently dynamic because nature is dynamic. Um, they're always multi multifunctional by combining engineering solutions and societal uh, um, benefits for, uh, for society. They're new, they're innovative, um, and they're always based on the local and very context specific. So you really need to understand the local context, both um, uh, the physical part and the ecological part, but also the social, economic and institutional context. So you very much need to think and act and interact in a different way um, compared to what we've done in all in the traditional uh, engineering um, uh, solutions. Um, and we have tested this concept in, uh, in various landscapes, mostly in the Netherlands, in, in sandy um, and marine environments, in, uh, in muddy lakes, in ports, in, um, in lowland lakes. Um, and from all of these concepts, we try to learn um, engineering and design guidance, how you can implement nature-based solutions and very much work together with all kinds of sectors and disciplines to um, develop knowledge across uh, these disciplines. For this um, webinar, I would like to dive into uh, our Building with Nature Indonesia, or what's called here Building with Nature, the MAC project on the top left part um, uh, of, the, of the screen. Um, because it's, it covers very, uh, uh, actually, most aspects that you need to focus on when implementing um, nature-based solutions. Um, so the MAC is located on the, uh, in Java, along the north coast, uh, central Java, just northeast of Samarang, um, and it's a, a coast that is very much under pressure um, as a result of um, uh, removal of mangrove forests and a transition to agriculture system, traditional agriculture systems. The, um, um, the, the, the coastal processes um, collapse more or less. So a lot of erosion, uh, a lot of flooding, and um, as a result of groundwater extraction, the, the, the land is, is uh, sinking very, very fast. So in some locations, the, the seabed of the, the land is sinking with more than 10 centimeters per year. So sea level rise as a result of climate change is, is not even an issue here. It's the, it's the ground subsidence and the removal of mangroves that contain the sediments. So the erosion has resulted in um, a lot of unproductive uh, lands, um, abandoned villages, um, flooded villages and, uh, and, and um, uh, destruction of roads and other infrastructure. Um, so a very serious, um, uh, very serious issues. So in 2015, we started an initiative, the Building of Nature Indonesia program, um, funded by the Sustainable Waterfront in the Netherlands and the International Climate Initiative in, uh, in Germany, an integrated coastal zone management approach, where we try to combine, um, let's say, traditional coastal engineering uh, with ecosystem restoration and sustainable land use and sustainable economical land use. Um, and this was very much done together with the local community and the local government in order to make a transition of land use in a more sustainable way. Um, and the basis of this um, solution was not so much engineering, but more a social, um, uh, uh, a social solution. Um, we brought together 10 villages and uh, farmers that were, um, were owners of, uh, of fish ponds and shrimp ponds. And we, um, uh, together with them, we, um, we set up coastal field schools and trained them how um, sustainable aquaculture practice could be used. And the, the primary objective was to integrate and reintroduce mangroves into the um, aquaculture system and try to convince farmers to um, to transform the aquaculture ponds that were lo located along the coast into uh, um, into mangroves of uh, mangrove forest in order to stabilize the coast again um, and together with uh, several knowledge institutes we were able to show that if you do that the quality of the aquaculture practices increase a lot so the, uh, the the number of harvests have decreased however as a result of a more healthy system we've been able to show um, and demonstrates um, that, the, that the productivity uh, increased with uh, three to 400 percent, as well as their income. So they really, by showing the, and working together with the farmers, that integrating mangroves and integrating ecosystems into their uh, economical practices and, and, uh, and livelihood practices, an increase in, in, um, um, in income um, is, is possible. So here are a few pictures of the of the measures we took. So on the left side, 
we integrated mangrove into the into abandoned ponds along the coast in order to stabilize the the muddy environment and muddy coast um, uh, as well as um, building um, uh, let's say floorboards, floor um, uh, um, paths along the along the mangroves, so people could also enjoy and fish uh, within the mangroves. Um, the the central picture show um, a transition of traditional aquaculture practices into integration of mangroves in their system. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see how uh, coastal field schools has uh, boosted their uh, their economy and, uh, and productivity. Um, and along the coast, we've introduced a system which we call um, permeable structures. And these permeable structures, they enhance sedimentation and sediment sedimented areas, again, um, enhance natural mangrove restoration. Uh, we know that in the world, a lot of investments are done to, um, uh, in, in mangrove planting, um, which fill uh, uh, most of the times. But by restoring the physical and ecological conditions wherein mangroves can thrive again, we've been able to show that natural mangrove restoration is, uh, is possible. Um, some of the figures that we've been able to accomplish, so we've uh, uh, been able to um, uh, have 20 kilometers of coastline under restoration, and we've restored 120 hectares of mangroves. Over 23 kilometers of per permeable structures were, were constructed. Um, and like I said, uh, the farmers have increased their income by three times. Um, this was very much a, uh, a success because of the collaboration we've been able to establish between uh, local partners, uh, international partners and national partners, uh, local universities and communities working together, um, knowledge institutes were brought in to train local communities and uh, local uh, students how, uh, how these practices were done, as well as engineering and contracting uh, experience were brought in, and especially the the collaboration with the Indonesian government, um, we were able to show um, that these solutions actually work and they've been able to replicate these solutions at um, various locations within uh, Indonesia. So, like many of the projects we've been able to execute within the Building with Nature program, um, we have identified that you need to focus on not only on the technical and design aspects, um, but there are other um, enablers that you need to focus on and are. And are often um, more important in order to overcome certain technical uh, issues. For example, uh, the institutional embedding and acceptance of, of certain solutions that are not part uh, of the typical standards that are um, accepted in a country is, um, is, a, is a very big barrier. And by uh, working together with the institutes that are actually developing these standards, we've been able to um, um, embed our solutions in the in the national standards in Indonesia. So they are able to replicate and allocate budget to it. Same with capacity building. It takes a lot of time uh, to convince and to have um, uh, local communities on board. Um, however, in, eventually it pays off. Uh, they've been able to take over our, um, our measures. Uh, they are responsible for the maintenance and they are able to, um, uh, to ensure a, a sustainable uh, impact on the, on the, on the long run. So just to highlight a few lessons uh, learned, um, this was a pilot and pilots are very much uh, very useful to, uh, to apply a learning by doing a process. So you're, you're allowed to fail, but you're also allowed to learn and replicate your lessons learned um, in these pilots. It's important to focus on the co-benefits of your solutions and uh, translate these into revenue streams. So people can show, uh, people uh, also understand that these, um, uh, that, that these nature-based solutions benefit their, um, uh, their livelihood. Um, and sure, long-term benefits uh, requires support from, uh, from the government, um, uh, in particular, if you apply these innovative measures in, in other countries where they're not used to these type of innovations, having a local uh, or national government on board of your team is, uh, is, is, is essential. Working with nature requires adaptive management um, and that really fits the dynamic character of uh, nature-based solutions. So applying adaptive management is, uh, is essential. So be able to adapt uh, to the changing environment and connected to this is the long-term monitoring that is required to uh, facilitate maintenance. But this requires also institutional embedding. Last but not least, active community engagement is, uh, is a key um, to create local ownership and a social structure long-term uh, embedding of your um, innovative 
uh, nature-based uh, solutions. Thank you very much. This was what I wanted to share. Um, I also want to uh, let you know that we have uh, published an, an end report of our projects. I can share the link in our in the in the chat if you are interested to read more about this uh, this project. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Falco. That was really great and interesting. Really great to see a project like that come to life. Um, I remind everyone that we'll have Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please enter them in the panel at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A. Okay, for now, let's move on to our second speaker. Mundi Coloni Skierdo is principal and co-founder at ECO a multidisciplinary firm in San Juan, Puerto Rico. He is an architect, a landscape architect, and associate professor at the Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico's Landscape Architecture Graduate Program and Architecture School. Both his design studio and technical classes focus on the planning of resilient landscapes and infrastructure. Mundi joins us today from Puerto Rico. Mundi, thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to it. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, let me see if I can put this into full screen really quick for you. Okay, you can see this, right? Okay. Um, and you can hear me, I guess. So, you know, as designers and in my case, landscape architect or architect, um, we sometimes find ourselves facing or encountering some new piece of information or some discovery or revelation that triggers you know, either curiosity or concern. And that comes in the face of, I have to do something about it usually. With the uncontrolled rate of climate change and the compounding threats of sea level rise and acidification of the oceans and habitat and biodiversity loss, you know, our way of life seems to be hanging on by a very thin, thin thread. And, you know, understanding that our relationship with nature is a big part of why we are here. Um, we've come to a reasoning that includes nature in our infrastructure, um, both thinking and design, is the reasonable way forward. So, oh, why am I not moving here? Sorry, there we go. So in the next few minutes, I want to address an idea um, on how design thinking and innovation can help build a framework for advocating for nature-based solutions. Um, I want to address it first as, you know, why do we need really advocacy and, and what is it? What tools we have at our disposal? And then show you, you know, a little project that I've been kind of working on for the past few years, where this is kind of an example and has helped me build my own framework. So as, as I'm sure you're aware of, if you've ever worked in an infrastructure project, um, these are complicated endeavors. This is um, the project I'm gonna to talk to you about later. This is the implementation um, timeline. From now it's 10 years out, but it has started 40 years ago, this project. So this is a 50 year old, this is a 50 year project for one channel for one river. And you know, if you try to add to this complexity of you know, the basic engineering of a project like this, the concept of nature and, you know, the uncertainty of nature, I am sure you will bump into a few technocrats that really don't understand what this is all about. Because our engineering uh, legacy is about single benefit infrastructure that with proven science can prove predictable outcomes. And, you know, that's not the case usually with um, nature infrastructure. So, you know, what is advocacy? What is advocacy and why do we need it? You know, usually we need to convince a lot of people and educate a lot of people and to get them on board and have policy change because even though we might have the best moral or ethical argument, most people are usually not on board and this does not mean automatically that you get policy change um, that you know, includes this type of solution into projects. So we must really try to understand what concepts are necessary for us to really, really delve into, which are usually not from our field of knowledge. There are two issues that I find that most advocacy 
frameworks that I've researched have. One is understanding frames or the issues and reframing them and then the trigger moments. So what are these? Um, frames is, you know, we subconsciously as humans have defined concepts and take a stance on concepts. Um, George Lakoff will tell his science students on the first day of class, don't think of an elephant. And, you know, immediately your head goes to this, you know, big animal that's heavy, that has floppy ears and trunks, right? It's inevitable. If I say elephant, you think of what we think of an elephant. And like that, when I say, for example, flood control, most of you or most technocrats, most engineers will go to a structural, you know, solution, a levee or a dike or any of these systems. And less of them will really think of rain gardens or retreat strategies as flood control or flood management strategies. Similarly, in advocacy, we have to be aware of trigger moments. For us recently, there's been myriad um, natural disasters that have triggered you know, design competitions or innovation because there has been a moment that has been capitalized by a group that have seen this moment and used it to our advantage. So we need to grow increasingly more aware of these types of moments. And then, you know, understanding that we need some sort of plan for this of a framework. I've gone out and reached and, you know, looked out for frameworks and there's plenty of them around. Most of them in either the business and, and development, business development um, world or in public health and policy world. And they have, you know, there's all these systems that are trademarked and whatnot. The one thing that I found common to most is one, you need to educate people. Two, you need to get people coalitions um, together. And then you need to get to decision makers. So as you know, we have design challenges that are in itself complicated, um, we need to find grounding and leverage on how do we actually present this information. So there's, there's three realms of challenges that I think we, we will all face and we all face. One is a technical, which is you know, very much in our field of design and engineering. We usually understand really well the technical issues that we're dealing with, but most people don't. There's a disconnect between decision makers and our technical world. Then there's socioeconomic, which you know, sometimes can be really hard to navigate. There's a social and political realms. We're not necessarily trained to deal in the political environment or to do, you know, um, to hang out with politicians and talk to politicians. Learn to talk to politicians is a, is a, is a task on its own. And you know, the other part of the social is that we might usually end up dealing with topics that are really delicate to understand and manage like social equity, um, environmental justice. And these topics are not necessarily within our training, formal training. And then lastly, there are challenges to implementation, planning time, bureaucracy, funding, which are also on its own when you start looking at policy, a world on its own. And it's hard to navigate. So we need to learn new languages. Now we do have some strengths as designers. Usually we are really, really good at graphics and that helps us be great communicators. Um, we might do a lot of communicating without using words because we can make great graphics. We understand the analytical aspects of our problems. We can identify problems. We can define paths to getting us um, places in, in our in our projects, and I, I, I usually talk about projects because it's part of the approach about design thinking. Now, design thinking, as I've come to learn, is a very iterative process. And when you go to design school, you know you do, and then you go back and you refine, and you do, and you go back, which is not really usual in the advocacy world. In the advocacy world, you have a goal and you set a set of paths and you follow it, and you don't really go back a lot at least not in paper. Um, that's not how the um, frameworks work, but we are used to doing this. And our solutions, if we wanna talk about nature-based solutions, require that we have adaptive management strategies 
we also need adaptive management advocacy strategies. So the other thing that I think we can bring to the table is what I call the mindset, right? We have ethics that we bring to the table when we talk about infrastructure, especially when we talk about nature-based nature, nature -based solutions. And, you know, I found this group, the Sets Convergence Lab, which I am now a part of, um, this theory that started um, in University of Arizona basically says that true resiliency lies when we understand the relation of the ecological, the technical, and the social, right? And this goes back to social equity and all of those other topics. So what is the framework approach that I'm proposing? It's kind of like a four, it's a five step, but it's a four prong strategy where there's a personal endeavor of understanding, learning, empathizing, and really visiting a site and learning the complexities of it. This is a very personal endeavor that you need to um, have. Then there's building coalitions of people, which is actually empowering as well, giving people the power they need, whether it's through information, stakeholder meetings, decision makers, meeting them. Then there's also exposing or reframing the issues, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, and also empowering people again with this new information, with new frame. And then lastly, hopefully, you get to actually providing solutions, which could be in the form of consultancy, on the form of you know typical advocacy, just you know speaking places and whatnot. Um, and then of course repeating. The, the fifth part of it is repeating or iterating. You need to go back. These things go back and forth. And as you build coalitions, you explore some more information, you also learn more. So you have to reframe again your information or your stances on things. So let me give you a quick run through of how I came to this and what am I what I'm what I'm doing with it. In 2017, we were hit in Puerto Rico by two major hurricanes in the space of two weeks. All of our infrastructures collapsed. And when I say all, I mean all. After that, you know, we had promised $63,000 million to repair and rebuild everything. Some of it has not, you know, hit land still. It's going to become in the next 10 years. Out of these 63, there's 3.5 billion US billions. Um, so 3,500 million that are going specifically to the Army Corps of Engineers, Jacksonville office to finish projects that they had already started. 1,500 go to the RPN channel or the Rio Piedras channel, which is a project that used to have 9.5 miles of concrete channels. It was asked for in 1978 and approved by Congress and designed between the 80s and 90s with 1960 sciences. There was a 1993 environmental assessment, which is still the valid one. It has just been validated, but it uses 1960 science for it. And it is being implemented as we speak. So looking to where I could be of most use, I found this group of people who had been looking at this, mostly scientists that had been looking at this project from only the environmental point of view for 10 years and really concern on what, what the environmental impact was of this. But this group didn't really understand the hydrology behind it. They didn't really understand or, or manage the, the technical aspects. And that's where I've kind of found a renewed sense of, of urgency with you know, the new funding and whatnot. And we formed the new Alianza for La Cuenca del Rio Piedras, which has since then for four years been building coalitions with um, community groups. And also these are maps of, of our coalition. This is like two years old now, this one. This is how our network has grown. This network now talks directly with the Army Corps of Engineers project team, also talks directly with community groups, has actually helped form new community groups, also provides some sort of um, uh, information agency, which the community groups usually don't have. They don't have access to information, but we have access to it because the Army Corps now has access. Since then, 
you know, this is recent stuff. We have made it so that now the, the community groups are asking for better science. They know that the project is required, but they want a better project. We've also, we're also commonly invited to technical meetings with the, Ar the Army Corps project, which in which we serve as technical advisors. So it is a sort of consulting. We have also served as facilitators. So this is the engineering with nature group from the Army Corps met for the first time with our project group on May this year. And we made that happen because they were both in Puerto Rico for different things. We know all of them. And we said, please go have a beer. And they did. Um, and you know, lately we've also met, have met, have made met the decision makers with community groups and state and municipal authorities. So where are we moving and what have we done in design um, through this four year process? We've done design charts with the design community in Puerto Rico, which produces innovative ideas, but also gets the word out. We've been providing technical info to the, the, to the project group in Jacksonville that they are not privy to because it comes from academia. Like for example, they didn't have updated land cover data, which we did. We've also produced, as we do, renders, maps, and all of this information translation to community groups that really don't understand what they're getting as a project and what they you know, could ask for. And you know, there are next steps. We have made it possible so that there is no concrete bottom anymore and that the impact of the construction is less because we're, they're using now the drift shaft piles, which have less of an impact in the area. And we're finally talking about ecology. We're finally talking about ideas on how to build a riparian habitat module. I call it the river reef ball, although I should, I know I shouldn't. Um, but you know, these are ideas that we, we propose to them and then they go back for a few months and ponder upon them and then come back with an answer or with more questions, which is great. Um, and it's, I think, where we want to be from now until the end of this project. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mundi. That was truly inspiring. And it's really great to see your own resilience in steering the ship so slowly but surely. Uh, okay, another reminder that we have that Q&A at the end, so please enter your questions in the panel at the bottom of the screen if you would like to ask anything of our speakers. Okay, let's introduce our final speaker. Gina Wirth is Design Principal at SCAPE. She works with cities, community advocates, and landowners to reveal the immense ecological and cultural potential of public landscapes. Gina is an advocate for ecological, for ecological systems design and translates research into practice, leading the design and implementation of complex multi-stakeholders landscapes. She joins us today from New York. Thank you so much and welcome, Gina. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Shlomit. Very excited to be here um, with this excellent panel of speakers uh, and sharing some work. Um, can everyone? See my screen, full screen. Great. Um, so I'm here today to talk about some emerging research interests, uh, both at SCAPE and in some of the teaching work I've been doing, uh, which is around the theme of designing for invertebrates. Um, uh, invertebrates are essential to all life, uh, and that's really one of the important themes and discussion points uh, of, of, the, of the talk today. Um, SCAPE has focused on designing for invertebrates for many years, uh, in full disclosure, with collaboration uh, with Econcrete, uh, thinking about underwater marine life, uh, particularly in coastal protection infrastructure, designing with nature along uh, New York City's coastlines after being hit by Hurricane Sandy, as uh, Mundi referenced in his presentation. But um, no, actually, I'm having a, a small issue. No, hold on. I'm going to reopen my presentation. It's like missing some information. Okay. 
No worries, Gina. We'll just bear with you while you find it. Here, I think I have it again. Um, hopefully this works this time. That working? Great. Okay. I was missing this slide before. I'm here representing Scape Landscape Architecture. Um, we are urban design and landscape architecture company located in New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco. Uh, and we work on a really wide variety of work. But as I was mentioning, um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about our work designing for invertebrates, which are essential to all life low on the trophic level, but critical um, to our existence. Uh, I'm going to pull from a quote here from E.O. Wilson, uh, who called invertebrates the little things that run the world. Um, and in this opening of the invertebrate exhibit at the National Zoological Park in the 80s, um, he gave his excellent speech, which I would highly recommend all of you read uh, if you're interested um, in why E.O. Wilson thinks invertebrates are so critical. Uh, but he, he posits that if invertebrates were to disappear, uh, he doubts that the human species could last more than a few months, that within a few decades, the world would return to the state of a billion years ago, composed primarily of bacteria, algae, and a few other very simple multicellular plants. So invertebrates are essential um, not just to human life, uh, but to most life uh, within planet Earth. And invertebrates today need our empathy. Uh, they can be very difficult creatures to connect with. They're not charismatic megafauna with big eyes and uh, sympathetic life cycles. Um, they're very foreign in many ways, unfamiliar. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a quiet extinction happening of invertebrates across the world. Um, whether you're talking about freshwater mussels or insect decline. I'm sure many of you have heard of the insect apocalypse, which has been widely reported in the media. Um, it was slightly overblown for a while, but has been uh, kind of recently more verified that insect decline is a major global issue that we are facing on many continents. Um, and so this kind of thinking about designing for invertebrates, designing for these lower trophic levels within our design work, um, I think is quite critical uh, to the future of design practice. And so as I mentioned, SCAPE has been working on uh, thinking about invertebrate design for many years, uh, mostly in our water-based work uh, with a couple projects. Uh, one is called Oyster Texture, which was a conceptual project for the Museum of Modern Art. One is called Living Breakwaters, which is under construction today. I'll show a couple images here. Um, but we've been thinking about this um, um, I think a very charismatic invertebrate, the oyster, uh, as the ecosystem engineer, has the capacity to build reefs, has the capacity to filter, it, filter nutrient contaminants from water, um, and also is a keystone species that provides habitat. Its reef building structure provides habitat to many other species and is also a food source. Um, within New York City, uh, oysters have disappeared from the shoreline and are making a very slow and steady comeback with the support of many um, ecological advocates and citizen scientists. Uh, in a lot of scape work, we often look back to look forward and to propose new design solutions. So this is a, a drawing that we made tracing historic maps, looking at the presence of oyster beds, oyster reefs, and shellfish uh, communities that historically existed along um, the Red Hook and Gowanus Canal shorelines uh, before urbanization. Uh, and this drove a kind of conceptual proposal for thinking about how a large scale urban reef and uh, wetland restoration, both within the Gowanus Canal and offshore um, that we call the Palisades Reef State Park, uh, could become part of New York City's future flood and uh, coastal defense system, uh, thinking really about this uh, engineering with nature approach uh, over a decade ago. So uh, in all of our work, we try to consider the life cycle needs of non-humans. It's very important when you think about designing for uh, non-human species that you think about providing their needs throughout their life cycle. Uh, the oyster life cycle within New York Harbor is a free floating uh, fertilized egg or larva um, known as a, a, a spat um, within the harbor and then it attaches, typically attaches to uh, harder structures or other oyster shells forming that um, reef kind of agglomerating structure over time. So as these free floating spat attach and locate, they build up these wave attenuating oyster reefs, which historically helped protect and buffer the shoreline edges and slow water at um, the, the coastal edges of New York City. 
So this project uh, was called Oyster Texture. It was in an exhibition framework at the Museum of Modern Art and shown here in exhibit form. Um, this project was never kind of built or physically realized, but it was very much an ideas and advocacy work that drove new thinking about shoreline design within New York. Um, and it also focused on a single species, not because that is how we should design. We definitely should be designing with ecosystem complexes in mind, not single species. Uh, but it became a very useful like human lens into complex ecosystems. Um, and it ultimately led to the development of our project Living Breakwaters, uh, which is shown here, a much larger scale uh, proposal for the south shore of Staten Island, which came into conception through the HUD Rebuild by Design initiative after Hurricane Sandy. We have a very large multidisciplinary team with many engineering partners advancing this work. Uh, this is a rendering and representation of the work. The goal is to create a large scale breakwater system that has aspects of a traditional wave attenuating breakwater, but also new um, engineering with nature aspects that extend the breakwater's edges uh, and create reef streets and reef fingers that are seeded with um, different devices and different structural conditions that allow for more habitat complexity uh, and encourage biodiverse marine life, uh, including habitat for vertebrate creatures like fish and harbor seals, uh, and also invertebrate creatures like oysters um, and uh, shellfish and uh, lobsters and other species. We've been working with the Billion Oyster Project as a strong partner on this effort. Um, and this is a little sneak peek picture. If you're interested in seeing more of this project under construction, um, this is on our Instagram feed and our website at escapestudio.com. Uh, this is the Living Breakwaters effort under construction. So it's a way of attenuating uh, kind of engineering with nature feature that reduces shoreline erosion, wave action within communities of Staten Island and builds underwater habitat. And again, Econcrete has been a partner on this project. Um, but I also wanted to pivot because uh, the theme today for me is designing for and with invertebrates. And I wanted to pivot to talking more about um, thinking about insect relationships, which where I taught a studio last semester, trying to take some of the designing with the full life cycle and the spatial and structural aspects of the work we've been doing with oysters and apply them to other invertebrates, uh, insects. And so I taught a studio at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in the fall of 2021. And I wanted to share a little bit of the thinking and the research here. Um, and as you can imagine, um, it's sometimes a little difficult to convince people that designing with or for insects um, is a good idea, uh, even though insects, again, are critical to human life on Earth, and they have incredible diversity. They're by far the class of animal with the most species diversity, that dwarfing all other animal classes at 1.3 million described species. Um, and what we know of insect diversity is likely just a fraction of um, what potentially exists with over millions and millions of insects, up to 80% remaining to be described. Um, and insect habitat is almost all landscape, no matter how rural or how urban insects live among us and often outnumber us, uh, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of volume and weight. Insects provide very critical ecosystem services while they can provide, uh, you know, negative risks like uh, agricultural uh, uh, invasion or uh, disease transfer. They provide enormous positive ecological services, wildlife nutrition, pest control, pollination services, dung burial, um, product production. Uh, they're critical for medicine and research, particularly in pharmaceuticals. Uh, the simple decomposition of wood is not a process that would occur without insects. And increasingly, they are uh, viewed as a food source that have been for many centuries and, and many continents. Um, yet insects, uh, you saw the earlier image of the insect apocalypse um, that the media has coined the phrase of, uh, in, insects are in great decline. So less than 1% of described invertebrate species have been assessed for threat by the international National Union for the Conservation of Nature, but 40% of those that have been assessed are considered threatened. Um, and I'm based in North America here in New York City, so I focused on North American statistics, where 28% of North American bumblebees are considered threatened, and 19% of assessed butterfly species in the US and Canada are at risk of extinction. So these are small anecdotes that speak to a large problem, and a problem that is relatively unknown, just given our lack of knowledge about 
comprehensive uh, you know, range of insect species and uh, the lack of study of insects themselves. And so um, I think this sometimes can feel like a very apocalyptic and, and, and uh, kind of situation that breeds inaction, but I love this paper. I would highly recommend anyone interested in this kind of read this paper um, put forward by Forrester Pelton and Black, which talks about and synthesizes some of the more recent studies around the decline of insect abundance and diversity, uh, but puts forward this uh, message um, that we don't know everything at all, and that's part of the problem, but we do know enough to start acting now. And so they highlight within this paper some of the main drivers of change that are causing uh, insect decline, urbanization, agricultural intensification, and climate change being at the very top of the list. And so the studio uh, thought about um, these aspects and how they relate to landscape architecture um, and how we can think better about fostering more positive insect human relationships within our work. Um, just as some quick research anecdotes pulled from the studio, uh, we have many kind of hidden relationships with insects that we don't acknowledge or understand. Uh, some are infrastructural. This is an example of mayfly populations uh, on the, that are laying eggs on roadways and bridges uh, across German rivers uh, because mayflies typically lay their eggs on the water and the way they recognize water is by how the water refracts light in the evening. Um, the asphalt refracts light in the same way and therefore uh, the mayflies are lured to lay their, legs, lay their eggs on these large um, highway systems which obviously like cuts off and disconnects the insect life cycle. Very simple relationships that are um, uh, <laughs> quite complicated and nuanced, uh, like vegetal relationships between insects and plants, how many species of insects, particularly those in the Lepidoptera or butterfly family, um, require specific host plants to even exist. So if you are looking to foster the life of a swallowtail butterfly in your backyard, you better have a host plant for it, otherwise it cannot exist in your landscape. So on the left is spice bush here that supports the spice bush swallowtail. But the, literally the plants that we plant are dictating the insects that can thrive around us. Um, and it's also interesting that the insect relationships are very, very micro. Um, the, the, you can think at the very, very large landscape scale, but you can also begin to think and design at the scale of a plant stem or a rock pile. Um, and as a landscape architect, our landscape practices uh, that are often celebrated and very much part of our culture, at least here in the US, like monoculture lawns and well-trimmed um, hedges and, and tree alleys in Europe uh, are actually quite negative for insect species. I think many people know that lawns don't support many insect species or much biodiversity at all, um, but even something uh, so beautiful as the Tuileries Alley that could support a Lepidoptera caterpillar nibbling on its leaves, if that caterpillar falls and does not land in vegetation below, again, it cuts off that insect life cycle and prevents its reproductive um, kind of success in the future. Landscape elements like thick hardwood mulch also present many, uh, many challenges for like ground nesting and dwelling insects uh, as opposed to leaf litter. Uh, and just how we manage and maintain landscapes by cutting gr back grasses too harshly or too early in the season um, can cut off the ability for a whole insect life cycle to occur. And so the studio was looking at these very complex conditions within the um, kind of territory of Massachusetts. Um, the objectives of the studio were to, for the students to build empathy and knowledge of insect needs through these investigations of the life cycle requirements for different insect taxa. So each insect had a, um, each student had a specific insect taxa they chose and investigated. This is the investigation of the firefly and soldier beetle life cycle. They were also asked to understand the relationships between different taxa of insects and other animals and plants and the wider landscape of Massachusetts, um, and then identify ecological, cultural, and economic conflicts between insect populations and human populations in the context of climate change. Um, and so I had many amazing projects. I wish we had time today to uh, kind of dig into all of them. I'm going to do a very rapid fire overview. You know, some insects chose to look at charismatic species like fireflies and soldier beetles like Jingying and Ziting looked at. Um, they developed a project thinking about collective um, suburban backyards and trying to develop uh, a strategy where landowners could devote 30% of their backyard to more diverse insect habitats 
link some of those needs with um, typical backyard needs like security, privacy, fencing, um, and develop the strategy, a kind of community engagement strategy for uh, diversification and creation of local uh, kind of resident firefly populations that could be stewarded by a single family or by a single landowner. Um, I also had students looking at threatened species uh, like Heeman and Leeway, who looked at monarch butterflies and the invasive species of cabbage white, uh, really thinking at a much more territorial or large like national scale about insects that require our entire landscape for their population success. This is an intergenerational kind of map of the monarch migration, which many generations complete. It's not one insect doing the full loop. Um, they developed a strategy for agricultural buffer zones and roadways within a very agricultural area of Massachusetts, thinking about a buffer zone system that could be thickened um, and uh, kind of respond to the different chemical inputs of that landscape and the physical uh, and environmental aspects of the landscape, developing a whole network of uh, buffer zones that could support the monarch populations through both of their up migration and down migration cycles um, and become part of a larger scale tourist landscape within agricultural um, Connecticut River Valley. Uh, and finally, I had students looking at uh, invasive species uh, like the emerald ash borer that Sitja Zhang looked at, um, understanding the large scale regional landscape change that's happening due to invasive insects uh, within, within our forests and our, our wider landscapes, um, how the emerald ash borer is decimating ash populations, her strategy focused on thinking about a large a buffer or management zone around a, um, a thriving ash forest that supported an endangered toad um, and how over time uh, uh, maybe wouldn't prevent the spread of emerald ash borer but could slow the spread and create a memorial forest landscape that would interpret some of that landscape change uh, to people who came to visit the space and study um, the both the emerald ash borer and the new forest typology that emerged. So I'm going to end there. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this more speculative work and happy to talk in the Q&A about how we're applying it in projects in the future. Thank you, Gina. That was absolutely fantastic. Some great volume of research that go, has gone into the design. So that's amazing to see. Thank you to all our speakers for your interesting insights and perspectives. And now we're gonna move on to a panel discussion which will begin with our first question, a general one for the, for the three of you. And it's about the way in which we incorporate nature inclusive design into projects in practice, because we all know that it should be part of the design process at the earliest stages, but in reality, that's very often not the case and we have to push for it retroactively. So, Foco, I'll start with you. At what stage did you incorporate the principles of building with nature into the project in Indonesia and what helped you do that? Um, what, I can, what I can say about this is that uh, the Building Nature Indonesia project, like all the projects we've done on the, under the EcoShape umbrella, um, all had the, the primary objective that there were nature-based solutions. So they were included from the, from the very beginning. Um, and most of them were, let's say, pilot projects or demonstration projects to show, to test if how a certain concept works. Um, however, I also work for Boscadas, which is a marine contractor, and we are uh, um, we have also uh, experience with implementing nature-based solutions. But contractors are often um, involved at a very late stage um, of the project development, and. Um, Although sometimes we have great ideas about how an in, in design can be improved um, with nature-based elements, we're often too late because certain permits are already applied or environment impact assessment already done. So there's very little space for contractors to, um, um, to, uh, yeah, to suggest alternative designs, even if they you know, make, the, make, make the project cheaper or um, um, more sustainable to implement. So, especially from the contractor's perspective, uh, I think there's uh, a lot to improve to, um, yeah, to keep also um, a bit of room along the, along the development line for, uh, for alternative uh, approaches. Okay, great, very true. Thank you for that. Uh, Gina, 
Uh, you next, on your side, what are the challenges that you faced in incorporating nature inclusive design at the earliest stages and how did you overcome that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's almost like a question of like, what challenges didn't we face <laughs> trying to incorporate nature inclusive design? You know, I think Mundy spoke a little bit to the, um, uh, and so did Foucault, the, the, the challenges of institutional change and how embedded technical knowledge with a singular lens can be very difficult to shift. Uh, we were very lucky with the Living Breakwaters project that we were working kind of through the lens of a um, design competition that was focused on innovation and resilience and not just working with the systems and structures we have. Um, and so we made that a critical piece of the proposal and I think it sparked the, um, the, the underwater habitat potential of the project sparked a lot of conversation and interest. Um, and you know, one of the big challenges we, we faced was when we were permitting the project with different regulatory entities like the Army Corps of Engineer, who's a regulatory partner on a project, not an implementation partner. Um, they're not building it. Uh, the state is building the project. Uh, the Army Corps uh, was very focused on getting us to define what was the most important purpose of the project. We had a like a three three legged stool of like it was about social resilience, it was about ecological resilience, and it was about physical risk reduction. Um, and we we never let go of that three legged stool. And we would not say that physical risk reduction was more important than the other two elements. Um, and ultimately that allowed the project it took a long time, but it allowed the project to be evaluated on all three of those fronts as opposed to only from a physical risk reduction perspective, which so much infrastructure in the states is evaluated purely through that lens, and that's why we have the systems we have. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Wendy, this is a great question for you. <laughs> the project uh, in Rio Piedras, I think, was already planned for several decades, and you got in there right at the end. Um, what are the tools at your disposal for, for incorporating nature-inclusive uh, design at the later stage of a project? And what would make it easier for you? <laughs> what would make it easier? <laughs> nothing. There's nothing easy about this. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to change the course of, of a big tanker while sitting on a kayak, you know, like trying to push it, you know, on, on one direction, which is, it doesn't want to go. Um, now, you know, coming, let's say, at the end of it, um, which is, it's really hard and understanding the regulatory processes that, that the Army Corps of Engineers goes through and what they mean when they say we're designing versus we're doing construction documents, for them design means something different than for us in terms of where they are in the process. Um, it's a very, very, very complex um, world. And you know, honestly, I am actually amazed that we've actually gotten anything done. Um, because as you, th there were four decades of this project kind of moving slowly but surely without any of us. Um, we wrote letters to the highest you know, commanders in, in, in Washington DC and said, hey, you know, this, is a, this is a problem. You're building a 40 year old project and you're gonna ruin our small neck of the woods. You know? And that helped getting the conversation started. Now, you know, this is this is atypical, probably for most, um, because usually you find out about these projects when they are being think, thought of on initially. And and it is it is an unsurmountable task. And I I suggest that nobody gets involved in anything like this because you will lose your mind, your hair, your everything. No, that's not true. Um, you need to care. This is happening in your backyards and you need to take care of it. Now, I wanted to address really, really quick something that you mentioned. How do, how do we get these on projects? Because this is my advocacy work. My projects, I was telling a few people last week, we're doing like six or seven projects that include bioswales in them. For me, stormwater is a big part of what we do daily. And of those six or seven projects, I have been asked for zero bioswales by my clients, but we're implementing them because it is our ethics. We bring it to the table. You know, you have to really believe it. You have to learn about it. You have to really get this like part of your ethics and then 
you just push for it. Nobody's going to ask you for it because nobody knows that, you know, what they see in the magazines is also their solution. That's, that's for us to bring to the table. I just wanted to add that. That's a fantastic full answer. And thank you for that. And, and we really appreciate your hard work because that's, that's what, what's, what keeps us moving along. Um, so that's really great. Um, I do see that we are, we will have a very quick Q and A. Uh, we're short on time. So let's just uh, load up uh, a good one. Hold on. Okay. So let's ask the three of you a general question. Um, so we understand the importance of research context and long-term thinking in designing a healthy environment, right? But why do you think nature inclusive is nature inclusive design is not in the mainstream and what can help change that? And let's begin with Gina this time. Sure. I mean, I think um, you know, one of the reasons I think it can be so difficult to advocate for it here um, in the States is that there aren't strong precedents for it often that regulators will approve. This is something that we have encountered over and over. Um, regulators, especially, um, particularly like with the Clean Water Act uh, in the United States, which protects existing coastal wetlands and, and water edges, um, they're very concerned with protecting what we have today. Uh, so when you think about like what you know New York Harbor used to look like, uh, there's not a mandate, a regulatory mandate to think about expanding our range of coastal habitats and ecosystems. It's very much focused on what what we have today and just keeping what that is. Um, and that is not, uh, you know, that's for a very important reason that we, you know, in the Clean Water Act was passed to prevent filling and um, you know damaging of, of the, the coastal wetlands that existed but we've lost so much and we're not able to just simply restore them because so much has been paved over or developed the land has been extended and so within living breakwaters uh, one of the things we had to do to convince regulators that it would be okay to place these elements within the water and impact existing sandy bottomed habitat, which we have quite a lot of, and add this high physical structure complexity habitat, which we don't have very much of in New York Harbor, um, was that we had to find a, a local precedent for it, not a you know, Florida precedent or a West Coast precedent, but like a local precedent in New York City. And so the uh, marine biology team went out and assessed um, small like riprap structures like at the base of light house posts and bug lights within the water and looked at the habitat diversity within those artificial constructed highly structural habitats and use that as a proxy and that ultimately got us over one of the regulatory hurdles for the work but I think it's that unfamiliarity and concern with negatively impacting what we have today as opposed to thinking about the much wider diversity of ecosystems we could be building in the future. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, you know what? I'm going to do a quick, instead of uh, taking this one to everyone, I'm going to do a quick fire last question for everyone just to finish on a high note. How do you quantify success in this field? Big one. Uh, Fogo, let's uh, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. As last question, well, you know, if it comes to engineering and um, uh, the field where I'm working, we try to find um, uh, solutions for infrastructure development um, and uh, uh, often uh, related to um, coastal protection, climate change, um, um, and uh, they traditionally we had hard, hard solutions for these like static solutions and we were able to to demonstrate success with these um, although uh, very um, um, focused on that single purpose but we were able to demonstrate success and I think these nature-based solutions that we these alternative solutions, I think, need to be able to show the same success as traditional solutions, plus provide added value uh, for uh, for nature and society. And I think, yeah, that's uh, in the end for a um, uh, for a policymaker that needs to implement these nature-based solutions. They need to um, uh, provide similar success uh, as uh, as these traditional solutions. So 
uh, that's the only way these uh, the, the policymakers and, and the implementers are able to implement these these solutions. Great, fabulous, thank you, Gina. How do you quantify success in this field? I'll keep it very short and aspirational. I would like to see, I would consider it successful if all projects had a formal system for evaluating not only non-human um, negative impacts of a project, but positive impacts of a project. Okay, great, thank you. And Munti, last but not least, how do you quantify success? Um, <laughs> No concrete bottoms. Yeah, um, that, that is that is uh, um, one way. No, but I mean there there is a, an engineering component usually related to our infrastructure systems that is very very single benefit, which you can measure you know and engineer the success of. So if that complies, and you get any other added value, that's a successful metric, right? Um, and you know you just add multiple benefits to the already single benefit infrastructure that, you know, needs to work. It needs to work because otherwise it won't get through, um, you know, the, all the other hurdles, right? I guess that's kind of the success. I guess every win counts. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, we're slightly overrun, but not too much. Thank you so much uh, to all the speakers. Uh, apologies for any uh, Q&As we didn't uh, get time to cover. But thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, thank you for joining us, for sharing your insights and for your, your knowledge and your learnings with us. Uh, it was really, really great. Thank you everyone who has attended and joined us today. We hope you took some uh, interesting takeaways from this webinar and a shout out to my wonderful colleagues at eConcrete for some great teamwork in making this webinar happen. We'll be in touch with that webinar recording very soon and stay tuned for the next technical webinar in our series, which we will update about. For now, have a great day and cheers. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.